I'm Adrienne Fairhall. I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington. So I work on computational neuroscience in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. And my first experience with MBL actually was my transition from my PhD in statistical physics into neuroscience and biology at all. And so I, I handed in my thesis and flew straight here to start the course. And it was being run at that time by the guy who I was going to work with for my postdoc, uh, Bill Bialik, and Rob De Reuter. And so it was a fantastic introduction for me to the field and to, and to my postdoc, uh, and sort of went from there. Yeah, oh, I, was, I was so excited because I, I'd been working in, uh, for my physics um, PhD, I'd been working in Israel, um, which I'm Australian by um, upbringing, and so Israel was, uh, was a tough place to live, and the physics community there is quite, uh, quite intense. <laughs> and so I was, I was looking for other avenues of, of research that would use the, the skills that I, that I had from physics, but I had um, the time that I'd chosen to to move toward this field, it was largely because of just amazing interactions that I saw and very interesting work that was going on at the Weizmann Institute that I got to be part of while I was while I was um, studying. But then uh, there were a lot of opportunities at that point for people coming from physics into into neuroscience, and so I'd met I'd met Bill Bialik on some of my interviews for jobs, and he suggested I apply to the course. So when I arrived here, it was at the beginning of a, of a huge change of life for me. I was moving country, I was moving field, and arrived here after a very stressful period, and it was just so much fun to just settle in and hear just amazing lectures every day, have my meals prepared for me, <laughs> just live sort of pure science and meet a bunch of young people who are incredibly excited and to hear from people who I, you know, I look back years later and I, I see that these were really the best people in the field and the concepts that I learned about during that month still are sort of pivotal ideas for me and have really sort of guided, you know, been, been sort of pegs for, for my research uh, going forward. So I, I, it was really one of the most exciting experiences of my life. I feel like I spent that whole month just on the edge of my chair. I got to come back as TA and sort of met year after year these sort of new cohorts of, of people coming through. And so at this point, when I go to SFN, you know, I, I know so many of the of the people in the field because of, of TAing or, or being a student. And then um, in my final, uh, I think it was the fifth year of Bill's course, he, I was faculty, so I gave lectures in the course. So I'd um, already moved on to a postdoc at Princeton with, with Michael Berry, and then um, Bill invited me back to, to talk about the work that I'd done during, during my postdoc. And so I had the experience of sort of uh, being student TA and faculty all in that, all in that five years. Uh, I have just finished my five-year cycle, so this is the first year I'm back as faculty again. So I was course director from you know, up to 20, 2012, so I guess that was 2008 through 2012. It was a, it was a, it was a moment in, I think, the history of, of, sort of quantitative neuroscience where there really were people who were completely uh, newly coming out of physics these days. There's, I think, partly because of the success of our course. You know, I have to say, if you look at uh, the population of people in this field scattered around the country, many, many of them are alumni of this course. And so they're now embedded in institutions all over the country and have started all kinds of programs that make sort of mathematical neuroscience or theoretical neuroscience much more accessible to students at an earlier point in their, in their education. And so there are graduate programs and graduate courses that students can get access to, to those ideas um, throughout their graduate school. So, as I said, when I was um, doing my physics degree at the Weizmann, that's, um, that's in Rehovot, it's, it's a very interdisciplinary um, campus. And so there was um, uh, sort of a, a new and growing group of people working on the brain uh, who were very open to um, a wide variety of different different perspectives and so I used to go quite often to the seminars uh, down in the brain building it was really kind of outside my my own work but I had friends who were who were working in that and 
more and more the uh, people working in neuroscience were coming over to the physics department to give talks about their work and so I was very uh, excited by what they were doing and I I just loved the nature of the discussions that would happen after talks. I remember particularly one on place cells. These are neurons that that fire. So if a rat is, say, running around in an environment, these neurons fire whenever the rat is in a particular location in that environment. I just remember the discussion after that talk as being so wide-ranging about, you know, what what could the origin of this of this you know this computation be how does that work and there were contributions from people from physics and from computer science and biology and they were having this you know it was to me the the definition of what what science should be like so respectful yet you know intense discussions to really try to get at the root of things people were coming in with ideas from from different areas and they were trying to make sure that they could express their ideas in a way that a, a broad variety of people could understand them. It, it was just so intellectually exciting to me, the, the nature of the, of the dialogue, and also obviously the, the subject matter, you know, how the brain works is something that's so obviously, obviously interesting. But being able to combine that question with techniques and, and ideas that that to me were, you know, I, I, you know, I lo I've always been a, a math person and being able to see mathematical structure behind these descriptions and these mechanisms was, was really inspiring. So that, that's what, what led me there and I, I've not looked back, I would say. <laughs>
And so what we found was that in, that was really true, that neural systems are dynamically adjusting their coding strategy in order to best, um, best represent the stimuli that they're currently observing. And so that idea that they're able to adapt to changes in the environment seems to imply that they're able to learn about the statistics in real time and do something to, to change them. And so whether that's really true or whether there are some mechanisms that just make that happen automatically has sort of been where my research has gone over, over the subsequent years. You know, so asking, looking for these properties in different sensory systems, seeing if we can get at, at some of the underlying mechanisms at the single neuron or the, or the circuit level. Well, I have to say every interaction I've had with people here has been, has been great. They, um, uh, that I, Gary, when, I, when he was um, um, director here, you know, clearly had a deep love for the, for the courses and, and was uh, very supportive of those. And I, I feel like just this common history and this sense of being part of, of um, of an institution that's been here for a long time. You know, we, I know my students, you know, they spend a long time looking at the photographs down in Candle House of, of this group of, of people out on the boats at a, neuro, at a physiology course from, I don't know, 18 something or other. <laughs> the idea that, that people have been coming here to these courses for such a long time, I know it really invests the students with this sense of just privilege and being part of a, of a tradition and that, you know, that, we don't get much of that, right? Everyone's coming from all over the world. They're part of very different institutions that have very different styles, and we can come together here, sort of be part of the American, you know, um, scientific mission, and you know, that's that's a great thing. I do think the the international um, aspect of it that the students in the courses come from all over the world, but we're sharing these very intense experiences, you know, not just our students in our own course, but the other students in the other courses. We interact with the Grass Lab um, fellows. They, a lot of our students go on to be, you know, several of them have, have gone on to apply for, for Grass Fellowships so they can come back. You see people sort of recycling into different roles, you know, either as students in one course, become students in another course, become faculty in, a, in another course. And so I think once people have come here, they seem to be a little bit infected with both the, just the wonder of being here in Woods Hole because it's a beautiful place. You know, and that, that matters a lot. You know, the fact that it's just so physically beautiful and just such a, a fun little village to live in. But then you're sitting in pie in the sky and Winfred Denk will come by, you know, uh, you know, these amazing scientists, Nobel Prize winners, people that you've, you've seen them give talks and being able to just live in a place where that is your, your community or your, your village is really, uh, it's amazing. You know, I, I, I love that about it. And just uh, dropping into a coffee shop and bumping into your scientific heroes is, is pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> To me, it's a place to come back together with friends to, you know, re-energize my excitement about about the field. It's a place that my family love to come. They think they, you know, I think it's an interesting um, aspect of being a scientist is that typically we're not earning you know a gazillion dollars, but but the scientific community creates structures where we can from time to time feel like we live in those <laughs> in those echelons of society that can have a, a summer place on Cape Cod, right? It's, it's really, I think it's part of why it is so fun to do this job is that you can live some pieces of, of sort of the high life that you know you've turned your back on. You know, science is rewarding intellectually. It's not particularly rewarding financially. And so what has been wonderful and that, you know, I've seen this in Europe and here is that there are certain ways in which uh, places like MBL or Aspen sort of give you those, you know, those wonderful moments that that allow you to to live really well, you know, as a as a scientist. And you know, my kids, they they would love to come here every year of their life. And you know, the opportunity to come back every year to a, a place that they're familiar with, you know, it's why people buy fancy vacation houses. You know. We're, we're not going to do that, but we have we have here to come, and it's a place that they love and that I 
I can be productive and contribute and, and enjoy my time too, you know, without having to, to take out the time um, to just do, do a vacation. So it's, it's um, I think it really does play a very, a very special role in, in many of our lives. And I, I certainly, you know, I know from the other courses that there are kids that came back every year, you know, the parents were faculty in the course year after year after year, and those kids just grew up together, and it was the highlight of their summer, and they went from five years old to, to 16 years old, and they went off to college, and they, they were still friends with the, the friends that they made here, and that's, that's pretty great, <laughs> that's pretty unique um, opportunity.